There's three things. There's product, there's marketing, there's support. Are you continually making your product better in response to the desire and feedback of your community and launching new products that they want? Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Perfectly Mentored. I'm your host, Jason Portnoy. In this episode, I get to welcome back Ezra Firestone. He's the CEO of Boom by Cindy Joseph, the founder of Smart Marketer, uh, One Click Upsell, Zipify Pages. The guy's in software, coaching, e commerce, a multi million dollar e commerce brand. This is the episode for you. He's so well known in the e commerce space, so smart. He's been at it for probably longer than anyone else I've known in this game. Uh, and just a, an amazing, amazing human being. You're not going to want to miss this one. Check it out. Thank you so much for coming back. Welcome back. Hey, man. Happy to be here. Thanks so much for having me. Perfectly oh mentored. If you want to be mentored, go somewhere else. You want to be <laughs> perfectly mentored? Fuck around right here. Love it. That's why you're a marketer. That's why you're a brilliant marketer. Um, look, it, it, it's, been a, it's been a while since we last jammed together. Uh, a lot's changed. So let me, let me like go right out of the gate here and put you on the spot. We're now 2021. What's the state of e-commerce in your eyes right now? Uh, dude, it's on and popping. It's, it's pop crack a out here. We're making it happen. There's a lot more people shopping online. I mean, the state of e-commerce is, is the same thing it's always been. It's just there's just a bigger pool, a bigger audience. More people have adopted the medium. More people are willing to you know, engage and uh, use, use digital currency to purchase products on the internet and have them shipped to their home in a bunch of categories that they weren't before, right? Grocery is all cra- grown all crazy. Um, was not a, it was not one of the bigger categories. And now everybody has adopted, you know, delivery groceries. So that, that vertical has really grown. Um, I just think there's been a technology, I think there's been a speed up of the technology adoption curve, especially for the older generations. Um, and then there's been growth in a lot of markets where, you know, people weren't necessarily buying in their regular life from that particular category. And now they're willing to, it's like, maybe you won't buy all your groceries online anymore now that you can go to the supermarket again, but you're going to buy some stuff on there that you weren't buying before for most people. So, so I just feel like there's been a, an acceleration of this sort of, um, adoption of, you know, delivery based commerce. So, if you're a business, right, an e-commerce business, and, and you run uh, e-commerce brands, how do you then look at like 2021 uh, versus LY, right? Like, how do you start comparing? You know, we saw you know, some you people say e-commerce grew, grew 10 years in the like 10 years in the last uh, in the last year alone. How do you then start comparing, and how do you look at your financials that way? Well, you you still you set a budget you factor in the COVID bump, right? You figure the COVID bump was probably for most brands somewhere in that 20 to 25% range, unless you were in one of these verticals like outdoor or camping or, you know, electronics or whatever. Um, Maybe your COVID bump was a couple hundred percent to some people, a couple thousand percent. So you just factor that into your model. If you're a brand that is, first of all, most brands are not sophisticated enough to be doing financial modeling a year out and looking at their P and L at, you know, the profit and loss against the previous year. And then against whatever they set their budget to like, that's a, you're talking now, um, high level multi-million, if not eight figure plus CFO on, t- on the team, financially literate, uh, brand, which is not the majority of people listening to this podcast. So I don't think most people have that problem. I think most people are just out there doing the damn thing, trying to make it work. You know, I don't think they're looking at a budget that they set that they're trying to meet. Now, of course I am, but I'm playing a different game. I've been in the game now 16 years. And so the way we do it, since you're asking that question is we, we factor that into the model. You know, you factor in what you perceive to be the COVID bump and you work against that, you know? So, I mean, but if you are looking at it, right, if you're looking at it and sitting there saying, well, you know, how do you track growth? Like, how do you plan for that? How do you know, how, how do you figure out it was a 25% bump for you? There's a lot of things that go into it. Um, historical years, you know, um, you know what what the market looked like um, in January through March when that was starting to wear off a little bit and things were starting to get a little bit less intense. Um, I mean, obviously, we did our budget in December, so you so we looked back instead of trying to project forward. We looked at what what did every other year's growth rate look like? What was this year's growth rate before COVID? And then what happened after COVID? And then what do we expect the lingering COVID effect to be? of the increased market adoption, right? So um, for us, I think we're just into perpetuity getting a 10 to 20% bump 
in the size of our audience that's shopping online. One, one thing about- but Here's another thing, uh, yeah. by the way, fuck budgets. What is the point of them? I mean, yes, hey, you got to do it and the whole thing and all that. But like at the end of the day, the goal is operate your business and be profitable. And if you're not projecting and holding, if you don't have inventory carry of six months for your hero SKUs, if you're an e-commerce business at a hundred percent over what you were the year before, you don't have enough inventory anyways for, for a growth spurt. So it's like, you know, the reason to project is to understand cash flow, to understand how much inventory carry you need and all that stuff. Um, but you've got to be aggressive on that anyways, if you want, you want to be prepared for growth. So you're always going to overly ag aggressively have, you're always going to have inventory as if you were to double your budget, if you're playing it smart, I think. Then you, but yeah, but then you get the people who are looking at their sales going, man, April, 2020, 2021 was 30% less than April, 2020. Like what went wrong? And you know, do you have those people? I've definitely spoken to a lot of those people and no matter well, what you want to tell them, they're like, well, no, we always compare it to L Y. Well, I mean, what is the point of even talking to them about? It's like, okay, <laughs> what, what, what are we doing here? Do you want to just look back and say, I'm not doing as well as this one year when the whole world shut down and everybody started buying online all crazy. It's like, feel free to do that. That's not a useful exercise, but okay. I got nothing to say to them. You know, okay. Enjoy yourself and that, and that mindset and strategy. It's not going to help you. Every year you should grow 10 years worth of, worth, worth of growth. Like uh, yeah. that, that's how it should and always also be. It's like, you. you know, you want growth year over year for sure, but more importantly, you want profit still. So, so some years you maybe aren't going to grow because of who knows what market conditions, advertising conditions, you know, supply chain issue, who knows you might stay stable, but what you really want to be looking at is, is EBITDA you know, is, is, um, you know, what you, you want to stay profitable more than you want to grow. In my opinion. One of the things I like about you is, is there's, there's so much noise in our space, so much advice, um, you know, just so much period. Uh, but there's also a lot that's wrong. And one of the reasons why I think you and I get along so well is because we don't talk hacks and you don't talk hacks and you don't, you, you talk fundamentals, uh, foundations, uh, we talk tried and true. So tell me, what are the most important fundamentals needed to grow your e-com business today, or maybe the core principles behind it? I've been doing the same thing since 2005. I have not ever done anything different than what I started doing back in 05. And then I'm still doing today. Traffic sources changed, markets changed, you know, the, the, the space grew, but I'm doing the same shit. There's three things. There's product, there's marketing, there's support. Are you continually making your product better in response to the desire and feedback of your community and launching new products that they want? So are you working on product at all times and treating that as an amorphous, ever evolving, ever optimizing thing? Yes or no? The answer is no. You're not doing as good of a job as you should be. Are you constantly doing a better job at customer support, being available to be reached, rewriting your support macros, adding, adding responses based on things that come in, changing up your FAQs and on-site copy and all that, like, you know, being available via live chat phone, reaching out to people, you know, calling them, asking them how their order was upsell, cross selling them. Like, are you optimizing support? Because support is a lot more than just email and chat. It's a philosophy. It's, are you keeping people's money when they want it back? If you are, you're fucked. You know, like support is a whole thing that needs to continually be optimized. Product and support are what keep your business going. Marketing is what gets it going, right? So marketing is storytelling, sales funnels, optimization, advertising, making a good promise, right? Because the best promise sells. The best promise wins in the marketplace, not the best product. But the best promise won't win you repeat business. The best product will. So, so the best promise will get you the first customer. And you have to get good at making a promise and telling a story and engaging, a, you know, because there's marketing post the first transaction, which is, I teach a whole course on this, which is, you know, content marketing, engagement, talking to a group of people about a set of experiences that they're having that relate to the products. The whole thing I've told you about several times, but marketing is the same level of difficulty in every business. Product and support vary from vertical to vertical and business to business in terms of difficulty. Um, so, so I choose 
markets and verticals where I feel I can excel at product and support. But I, I mean, I've been doing those three things and working on those three pillars of business and getting better at them since I started. And that's what I will continue to do. And it's like, that's what it comes down to. And there's nuance and all that. And we can talk through the technical and the tactical and the strategies and all that, but it's like at a high level, those are the pillars that need to work for the so brand. There's more, there's more to growing a brand than Facebook ads. Yeah. There's all kinds of stuff, man. You know, although Facebook is a really good um, channel for visibility for sure. I mean, it's my number one um, by a long shot, but I also, you know, I'm selling to a, a dem demographic that is mostly there. They're not really on Instagram. They're not really on Pinterest. They're on Google, you know? So I, I'd love to hear from you because we'll, we'll get into the marketing pillars. Are, uh, that's, that's, I mean, you're known for that, but I, I want to give you, you know, the ability to speak your expertise on the two other pillars that you just named. What questions do you ask internally on how are we making our products better? Like, what are you looking at all, all the time in order to get well, better? There, there's two things with that, which is what do you care about? And what does, what do your customers care about? I care about sustainability, right? So I'm always trying to make my packaging more sustainable. I'm printing printing stuff on plantable paper that, that you plant it in the ground, it plants a garden. I'm using ocean waste plastic and post-consumer resins. I'm using sugarcane biopolymer. I'm using you know hand-sewn organic cotton from factories in India that supports those women in getting access to healthcare and, and reproductive services, uh, reproductive healthcare stuff. So, so I'm constantly optimizing the sustainability of my, of my packaging, which is one thing. And then there's what's actually, you know, I, I make lotions and potions in, in this brand that is my hero brand that I talk to people about. Uh, and so then there's like, what goes into the stuff that I'm making? Where does it come from? Where do the people that are making it get it from? Where do those people get it from? Tracing every ingredient back to its original source. Is the palm oil, which I don't use palm oil, but, but if I was using palm oil, is that leading to the deforestation of the rainforest? Like there's just, you can go really deep with, with product and understand what goes into it. Who's making it? How's it being made? Why is it being made that way? Are there better sources? You know, is it sustainable? Is it good for the people who are making, you know, people who are doing the producing? I don't think most people are paying that much attention. It's like, fuck it. I produce something in China. And it's like, yeah, but was it with slave labor? You know, like, is it some, uh, some piece of plastic that's going to end up in a landfill? Like what kind of shit are you making out here? And is it in integrity with your own moral compass? Um, so I think there, you can go really deep on product and we do, we've got a whole department. We, you know, it takes us six to 12 months to launch a product because of how complex it is to get a formula, right. To get the ingredients, right. To get the supply, the packaging, right. To, you know, it's like, it's no small task if you're really doing it well. And of course, you know, you got to start somewhere. So you start, you start selling and then you optimize, Hey, maybe we could, you know, I used single use, um, single origin plastics, uh, and single use plastics forever until I could afford to use uh, recycled plastics. Like, so you got to start somewhere and then you can move up the ladder so you can continually optimize. And it's like, what do people want? Well, you know, they think that this, uh, you know, cream is a little too oily on the skin. Well, maybe we can reformulate it and modify that. Like what kind of feedback are we getting from our community? This, uh, mascara, it doesn't go on quite dark enough. Let's up the intensity of it. Like you can listen to the feedback of your community and optimize both the feature set of the product and the um, manufacturing process of the product and the sort of uh, packaging and product inserts and paraphernalia that goes with the product. I think what you, what you said is so important in terms of listening to your community. Uh, I don't think e-commerce businesses do a good enough job trying to build a community around, around their business. So instead of saying, Ezra, how important is building a community? Because I know the answer to that. What are your, uh, some of your top tips in order to build a community around, you know, your, some people may just be looking at it. I'm just a clothing brand. I'm just this. I'm just that. How do you build a community around a brand? Well, so, so most people understand the what, which is the product. What is it? What are the benefits of owning it? You know, what are the features? What are the benefits? They don't necessarily understand the who and the why, which is who's buying this and why are they buying it? You know, apparel. Generally, people buy apparel to um, create a particular, uh, not, not always, right? Some people are buying rock climbing apparel for functional use or whatever, but, but a lot of apparel is about um, a person's identity and how they want to show up in the world and how they want to be perceived by their social group and looking cool or fitting in. And so 
there's a lot you can do if you understand who's buying your stuff and why you're buying it. You can talk to them. You can create content that is related to that experience that that group of people is going through. And like the game with, with building community around your brand is it's as simple as, you know, first of all, it's content, right? Everyone talks about content. What is content? Well, it's written stuff. So articles, it's video stuff, it's audio stuff, it's, you know, memes, it's, you know, there's not that many pieces of media, image, text, video, GIF, you know, like there's, so, so it's a piece of media that you create or, or a piece of content that's straight written that you put out in front of the audience that you have via putting it on your blog, via sending it to your email list, via posting it to social and amplifying it with ads. You put it in front of them and you hope that it entertains them, engages them, makes them think, uh, has them feel connected to you, you know, ask them a question. There's a lot of stuff that you can do. We got a whole course on this, but like the idea is you're putting out content that your audience or potential audience sees and it makes them feel something or respond in some way, you know, makes them feel or think. And that process goes really, really deep. And there's a lot you can do there, but at a high level, it's like create content that's relevant to the life experience of the group of people whom are buying from you and make sure they see it in between when you try to sell them stuff. And we can talk a lot about how to do that, but like at a high, if you understand the direction to go in, you can move in that direction. You don't need to do a lot of it. One piece of high quality content is a lot better. That That's really like, for example, a smart marketer, I had a post that I ran for like three years as an ad because it really just hit. People responded to it. It felt good. They liked it. They commented on it. It's like, you don't need a lot of posts. You just need one that resonates and you can go really far with that. For Boom, I had one article I ran for three years because it just worked super well. And I started running all my traffic to it because it worked better than sending people to my product. So it's like the idea that you need to continually, you know, post on Instagram every day. This is some bullshit that people will tell you. You got to post all the time. And it makes people feel overwhelmed about content marketing. Content marketing is not about quantity. It is about quality, 100%. And then distribution. Are you getting it in front of those people? Because by the way, posting that shit on Instagram, nobody's going to see it, dude. Instagram gets a 1% to 3% organic distribution rate. You want people to see it? Got to pay that cash, baby. Cash rules everything around me. Cream, get the money. Facebook's getting your dollar dollar bills, y'all. They're fucking, they're not going to let people see your shit unless you pay them. Well, we'll get it. We'll get into the the, the paid side in a second. Um, one one of the things when it comes to marketing and and put out content, the next thing is diversify, uh, omnipresence. With attribution now being so gray, you know, I've seen stores that are doing great ROAS wise on every single channel: Google, Facebook, Snap but they were losing money. Uh, the Delta was just so wide from a Facebook side of things uh, that the other channels were just double dipping. How do you look at this when growing your brands? Um, well, I don't know that you need it, by the way, because most brands have one source of profitable visibility. Either it's Facebook or it's organic traffic or it's SEO or it's Google AdWords or it's Amazon. Generally, you got one source of visibility that's super profitable. And then all the other sources of visibility are like break even or at a loss, but you're acquiring customers that you then monetize. Like, let's say I make hundred grand a month in profit from Facebook. I'll take 99,000 of that and spend it on acquisition, even at break even or a loss on other channels to grow my customer base. Because then Q4, when I run a sale, I got a big customer base. So, so I think this idea that you need every channel profitable is not accurate if the goal is scale. Now, if your brand is just not profitable, you don't know what you're doing, right? You've, you've fucked something up. If you are... Tell me if I shouldn't be swearing all crazy. On no, no, go for it. Way. No, you're okay. like, yeah, if you're, if you're just not, if you're making sales and you have positive ROAS on Facebook and you're not profitable, you don't understand how to read a PL and figure out whether or not your salary is too high or whether or not your cost of goods is too high or whether or not your inventory carry is too much or whether or not you're spending too much on shipping or insurance or some other thing. It's like you got five big line items in e-commerce. You got cost of goods. You've got cost of team. You've got cost of shipping. You've got cost of insurances and things that you need to run the company tech, you know, um, you know, staff computers and, 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 you know, uh, IP like, like, uh, trademarks and, and whatever. And then you've got, um, cost of technology stack. Those are your five big line items. One of those things is what's going to sink you. Let's say it's cost of goods. Well, let's say that you are buying for one and selling for two, you buy for five and sell for 10. 
you're never gonna make any money. You don't have enough margin in that product. So it doesn't matter how good Facebook performs. You just don't have enough margin to have that $5 in profit on that order cover your cost of salary, you know, um, cost of shipping, if you're giving free shipping and not charging for it, cost of other random stuff that I told you about, and then cost of tech stack. It's like, those are gonna be your five big line items and you gotta optimize those. Um, and that's how you stay profitable, you know? And I've got a good little matrix for it's like, really, you don't wanna spend more than 30% on product. So like, if your margin isn't 70% plus in e-commerce, it'd be hard to make it, you know? Um, so I say buy for one, sell for five. Buy for five, sell for 25. Buy for six, sell for 30. Buy for seven, sell for 35. Buy for eight, sell for 40. Buy for nine, okay, maybe you can buy for nine and sell for, you know, maybe you can buy for one, sell for four there. Maybe you can buy for 10 and sell for 30 because you got enough delta. The bigger, the the higher the price point, the lower that delta can be in terms of what you pay and then what you sell for. So then let's look at it from the acquisition side of things. What's a good like MER for an e-commerce business? Obviously, I guess it depends on the size of the revenue, but what's your ideal breakdown of, of how much revenue should be spent on marketing? 30%. 30%. Yeah. So basically you make a million dollars in revenue. Okay. A million dollar business in revenue probably only has 300 grand in profit. Maybe not, maybe not even maybe 200 grand in profit. Let's say you make a million in revenue, you spend 300 grand on cost of goods. You know, you spend uh, 200 grand on salary. You spend 300 grand on marketing. So well, let's say you spent hundred grand on salary. So you spent 300 grand on cost of goods, 400, hundred grand on salary. So 10% of your overall net. So now you're at 400 K and spent 300 grand on cost of good. Did I say cost of goods already? A cost of marketing. I mean, so running ads and stuff like that. So now you're at 700 grand and then there's, let's say a hundred and random shit shipping and tech stack and whatever. So now you got 200 K in profit left over. It's probably about a right matrix. I think that 100% of that profit should be back into ads the next year, 100% of it. And and when 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 I say 100 grand in staff salary, some of that's going to you as the owner. You know, maybe maybe a couple grand a month or whatever you're pulling. Like, but a million dollar a year e-commerce business doesn't have a lot of surplus cash because it also needs money for future inventory carry, right? So that million dollars that you brought in, let's say there's 200 grand in profit. Well, maybe 100 grand of it goes to future inventory carry, and then you got 100 grand left that you can then reinvest into ads and other stuff. And then of course you're, you got cash flow coming in. So you can, even if you don't have it in the bank, you can keep spending. So, so my, my ballpark is between 25 and 35% of your top line revenue should be spent on marketing in terms of advertising. Um, and I think does that differ if you're, that does that differ if you're like a, a nine mil, a, a nine figure business versus a six figure, seven figure I'll, business? I'll do 50 million this year and I will spend 35% of my top line on ads. So, 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 but it's also about how aggressive do you want to play, right? You can play at 10 or 15%. If you're doing under 10%, you're not being aggressive enough. If you're in that 10 to 15% range, okay, great. If you want to grow the way I want to grow, you spend 30 to 35%. And of course you need, you know, 70 to 80% margins and you need to be optimizing all the other line items, but you can do it. And, and I'm, I, I reinvest hundred percent that I can back into the snowball to grow. I love it. And, and, and it comes down to the fact that most businesses just don't know those numbers, right? So they make up random ROAS that they need on Facebook in order to be profitable, but they have no clue what their numbers are. numbers are. How often do you sit down with the team and really dial in on those numbers? So we review our weekly KPIs. Um, and in fact, I just got them so I can tell you what they are. Um, and we do this every week on our management meeting. So I'll, I'll give you the line items on our KPIs. You interested in that? Sure. sure. All right. Of course. So my KPI document has metrics that I look at every week. Now, of course, I look at the P&L every month also, right? So the P&L yeah. is different than the KPI. P&L is your straight profit loss with every every line item on your um, in your business. So every expense in your business versus the revenue. And you can see and you can compare that to the month before. So if you're not looking at your P&L, your profit and loss statement every month versus the month prior and the year prior, you're not doing a good job in e-commerce. Uh, in terms of financial literacy and intelligence, but, and then I also not just e-commerce. I think that's any business. Fair enough. I, I take it a step further and I look at um, a weekly KPI sheet that has net sales and the year over year change from the week before um, net sales versus the budget that we made. So, so what was our net sales versus what, what do we budget and what's the percentage change there? Like, like this week, for example, um, we, this week we are up. 25% from our budget, uh, discount rate. So, so total revenue 
that was discounted, right? So, so what percentage of our total revenue was discounted? So, so in this case, it was 8.9%. So basically of all of our revenue, this, uh, we, we gave 8.9% total in discounts. So if that number goes up or down drastically, I'm curious about why yeah. should always be in that sort of nine to 10% range, because we generally have a 10%, you know, exit intent, et cetera. Maybe we're running a big sale and it jumps up like, but you gotta be watching your, your discount rate. Uh, new customers as a percentage of total sales, repeat customers as a percentage of total sales. So what percentage of my total sales came from new customers never bought from me? What percentage of my total sales came from repeat? Ideally, that's in a 60, 40 range pretty much at all times. 60% new, 40% repeat is kind of what I shoot for. Um, marketing spend as a percentage of net sales, like we just talked about. So how much that I spend on ads as a percentage of my net revenue and then marketing spend as a percentage of new customers because it's different between repeat and acquisition. So if acquisition is super high, if it's like 80% of my marketing spend was spent on you know new customers acquisition, that's not good. Um, so I want that to be in a certain ratio. So, well. so just, just you're, you're looking at 30% of your revenue because before you said top line. So now it's net, you're looking at it from a net point or gross revenue. Uh, gross rent okay. net sales is in, in, on my Got KPI it. sheet is, is, is net revenue, right? It's Got not, it. it's not Perfect. net in net sales, Got it. you know, not like, yeah. like total revenue. Got it. So 34% this week was, um, uh, let's see, 28% this week was net sales number. And then new customer marketing spend as a percentage of new customer sales was 53%. So we don't have to get into all that. Anyways, we can, yeah. we can go, go deeper, but, but then there's Facebook revenue and ROAS, right. And uh, Google revenue and ROAS and, you know, spend as a percentage of net sales, of course. Uh, so in this case, 22% of my, my spend was on Facebook. Um, 6% of my spend was on Google, uh, as a percentage of the net sales. Then I got my Amazon sales and those are the ones I look at. Oh, average order value, by the way, I didn't mention that average order values on there along with percentage change. I think the big ones, I just went through a lot of shit yep. is net sales versus the week prior, the year prior, average order value, discount rate, and then marketing as a percentage of net sales. Look at those four. So how does your media buying look in a cookie-less, attribution messy tracking free world that is either here or coming what's that going to look like for you well we've got a server side pixel and um sort of data model we're, we're pretty sophisticated because we've got a lot of money to spend and we can hire third-party attribution firms to help us um but basically you know we want that i think a good way to look at it it depends on your margin structure is basically facebook's guessing Google's guessing, right? Like they don't actually know, like they can't with iOS 14, there's a lot of stuff they can't track. Um, so, so we still use Facebook's internal, you know, ROAS numbers and Facebook's internal CPA numbers. And we just optimize those the best we can. Um, and we also look at a daily, you know, money out, money in metric. So it's like, you know, if we spend 10 grand on ads, we want to bring back 30. And if that is off and, and that's all revenue, right? That's, if I spend 10 grand on ads and I make 30 K on my site from emails and repeat and direct traffic, I don't care just on a daily basis. I need to spend one and get three. Um, and if I do that, my business works. And so I have a high level and then I've got my Facebook dashboard that I use. I mostly still just use Facebook, um, and optimize for the CPAs that I want within Facebook and it works. Can you grow an e-commerce business today without paid media, without paying without paid ads? You can do anything you want. There's a lot of shit you can do. You can have a fucking PR firm. You can get influencers. You can do all kinds of stuff. What would you do why, if you weren't? What would you do you if would? you couldn't run ads? Oh, sorry. Go. That was an important question you just asked. Yeah. Why you would not use paid ads? I don't know why you wouldn't use paid ads. It's the best way to get traffic. You know, it's the best way to go to a traffic store. You go to the traffic store and you buy visibility and you test shit out. I mean, I don't know why you wouldn't do that. I think SEO takes super long, kind of a nightmare. I use it as sort of a secondary strategy just for my brand queries. Like I don't care so much about SEO as like a um, business growth, unless you got a ton of SKUs. You got, if you're a thousand SKU retailer, great SEO all day. If you've got 12 SKUs, it's not, there's not going to be a lot of queries that are going to be super 
you're unlikely to, uh, unless you're in some kind of vertical where it's like, there's just tons of search volume in that hobbyist or enthusiast market, like rock climbing, you know, there's all kinds of crazy rock climbing stuff that you could create articles for and rank for, and then lead back to your product. Sure. You know, you could do that strategy still slower. And I think second tier to, to paid ads, there's influencers that's pounding the pavement and paying them. So it's really paid ads. There's PR while well, you're paying the PR agency. So that's paid ads. Um, you know, what would you do I if, I took, if I took away Facebook ads from you? How would you grow the business? I go find somewhere else to buy ads. Google, oh. Taboola, Outbrain, Twitter, LinkedIn, Pinterest, uh, you know, display networks, just different, different display exchanges, uh, TV, radio. I, I love how you said the traffic store. And, and, and I, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on this. I, there was a great quote that, was, that I read the other day that most people die of indigestion and not starvation. Um, you know, everyone who comes and builds a store all think they have a traffic problem. If only I got more traffic. If only uh, more people came to my store, then I'd be more profitable. How many of these people, would, and you've coached tons, thousands of people, how many of these people really have a traffic problem versus a failure to convert that traffic problem? I think, yeah, I think that's, I think you're right about that. You know, I think that's the number one issue is people, you, you can go out and borrow 10 grand from your cousin if your cousin has 10 grand or five grand or one grand and buy as much traffic as you can buy with that. So, so traffic is available. It is, is your creative compelling enough to get someone's attention and, you know, get them in an open to buy mindset. Does your sales page or pre-sell article do the job of convincing them to consume the content on that page and click the add to cart button? You know, do you like, it's all about, it's all about the storytelling. It's all about the ads the ad creative. It's all about the optimization of the funnel. Um, traffic is actually the easiest part. You just go say, here's who I want to show my ad to, and here's some money, right? It's like traffic is super easy, but the storytelling and the creative and the sales process and the email marketing and all that, th that's the hard part. How important is awareness when it comes uh, to growing a business in, in terms of generating awareness, in terms of building a brand? How important is that when it comes to dominating your market? I mean, it's everything, right? It's like, what's well, it's kind of like, how important is the peel of an orange? The, 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 how important is the, the, yeah, the orange peel, the, the orange stuff that goes around the actual fruit. Well, it's like, if you didn't have that, your fruit wouldn't rot and die and only live for a second and probably not even grow. But how important is the actual orange slice? Well, that's the party in your mouth, right? It's like, you can't isolate one from another. There is no business without awareness. There is no business without re-engagement. There is no business without, you know, there is no business without once they're aware of you, what do you do then? Like, it's just, there's no way to pull that out and say, how important is that? Well, that is the first step, but it's not the only step. So it's like, you need that step, but you also need all the other steps. So, so how important of it is it? Well, if you do a good job of it, you got a chance because then you can get them to the next step, which is consuming the sales material. But if you don't generate awareness via advertising, in my opinion, best way to do it, well, then you never get the opportunity. So I don't know, you know, I, I don't know. I think it's important, but I don't know that it's more important than whatever comes next, which is, you know, your, your sales message. Well, one thing, and then how important one, one is thing the precedes product itself, the other. Right? Yeah. How, how important is the product? Well, without awareness and without the consumption of the sales message, they don't get the, and them saying yes to that, they don't get the product, but once they get the product, well, that's everything. So, because if they don't like the product, now you're hosed and they're refunding you. So, or they're never buying from you again. So it's like, I feel like every one of the pieces of the puzzle is as important as every other piece of the puzzle. Top five or, or more, if you, if you want, most important software needed to grow your e-commerce business. And you could definitely plug. Um, dude, I don't think any, anyone is that, that overly I think any technology stack works. I've seen people on the bunkiest, bootsiest technology stacks making nine figures, like bullshit built in the basement. Like I've seen some crazy stuff. Now, do I think there's a better tech stack than, than, than others? Yeah, but I think every tech stack can work in this day and age. Is it better if you have expedited payment methods and a super fast checkout, things like PayPal Express and Google Pay and Apple Pay and Amazon Pay and Shop Pay? It's a lot better than if you don't. You know, is it better if you've got, you know, a um, sales process that has optimized pages for desktop, tablet, mobile? 
better than if you don't. Is it better if you know you're you're able to offer upsells and cross sells, post purchase, thank you page, pre purchase, and the cart product page? Better than if you don't, you know. So yes, there is an optimized version of a technology stack, which I would tell people start on Shopify with Clavio. If you do those two things, you're further ahead than if you start with Magento, which I don't even know if you can anymore. OS Commerce, WooCommerce, Big Commerce, you know, um, Square, Wait, Woo, you know, Wix. I think I think Shopify and Clavio together, plus of course, you know, Google Analytics and Facebook and all that fit right into Shopify. You can use apps like subscription stuff, like recharge, like landing page builders, like Zipify pages, upsell apps, like one click upsell. These are my apps. Um, but I think the two easiest places to start are for an e-commerce merchant, Shopify, Klaviyo. That pairing is going to do 90% of the lifting for you. Biggest holdback of, of, of stores that are doing six figures scaling to seven figures. Um, mismanagement of finances and inability to delegate um, tasks. So, so most people who are at the six-figure market are do-it-yourself entrepreneurs. They're doing all the tech all themselves. They're doing all the ads all themselves. They're writing all the copy. They're doing the customer support. They're managing the supply chain. They, they don't understand systems, processes, tasks, checklists, organization, delegation, the concept of buying help and bringing somebody up, the letting go of control and giving someone autonomy. Like they don't get uh, team and team is ultimately what leads to scale. Um, you know, you can have a single person or two person business with outsourcers that gets to multi seven figures, you know, shit. Moise Ali got to like 30 million a year with like six people and outsourcers. So you could definitely do it. But I think generally what holds six figure brand owners back is like they, they've, they've proven concept. They've established market. That's really like, okay, now what? Well, now it's scale. Scale comes from systems, processes, team delegation, and infrastructure, which if you're like micromanaging and trying to do it all yourself, you never, you never do. So, I mean, I mean, I, I want to go deeper on that because you've managed to escape the hustle. I see you living your best life, beautiful cabin, which like I said, I'm really hoping I get to join you camping at. Um, but, but you also run multiple million dollar businesses. H like for the listeners, how, how, how do you do that? How can the listeners build that? Uh, maybe the steps in terms of what it takes, the hiring, the systems would love to know how you were able to accomplish that. I, I was doing this before I had a lot of money. You know, you don't need a lot of money to prioritize your physical body, you know, and make time to work out and make time to, you know, get outside. And but that's everyone's time. excuse. If only I had more money, I would, I would I, be able to I do understand. that. But I'm saying, my point is it's a choice that you get to make. You get to decide are you victimized by your work life and your kids or do you do, or you do, you do what it takes to have a social life, which maybe it means seeing a friend once a month. It's like every day, or do you do what it takes to invest in your relationship with your significant other? If you have one, have a date night once a week, you know, um, do you do what it takes to have a hobby, something that's just yours that you love to do that you do? It's like, you don't have to do a lot, but you do have to do it. And then what happens is the more you do it, the more it becomes a part of your routine and the more space that there becomes for it. Like you get to choose are like, do you spend 14 hours a day working because work will fill the time that you give it. And so if you don't set hard boundaries around your work life, you will overextend yourself and burnout. So it happens to every entrepreneur at some point. Um, and so you've got to get good at uh, being deliberate about how you're going to spend your time. You have to be ruthlessly efficient and, and willing to, and it's, it takes eternal vigilance. It takes up showing every day and making that choice. It's like a diet or a workout program, or, you know, it's like generally people will, um, give that kind of intention and attention when they're motivated by pain. Oh no, my, um, kidney is messed up because I haven't been taking care of myself. Now I'll do it because I'm in pain. It's like, what you want to do though, is imagine that you were in the kind of pain that will come if you continue to lead a type of life that is not supportive of your physical body and your mental body and do prehab preemptively get out in front of, and by the way, you'll enjoy your life more, you know? So from the very beginning, I was committed to, I'm going to build a virtual team. First of all, I started with no money. I started working a full-time job. I took the, uh, I, I walked the path of you know, do it yourself, solopreneur to hiring people to now having 130 people plus and multiple 
seven and eight figure brands and all that. But that took me 15 years to figure all that out. Right. But, but the whole time I was committed to, I'm going to, this is a marathon. It's not a sprint. And I'm going to have my relationship with my wife be the most important thing in my life in front of everything else. And I'm going to invest in that. And that's going to be my main hustle and everything's in support of that. And I'm going to prioritize that. And I'm going to use these businesses to try to, uh, first of all, I'm still working a full-time job at the time. So I'm going to work this full-time job and do these business at night. But eventually I'd like to have these businesses working so they can pay for our life so I can work from home and hang out with Carrie. And I'm going to take care of my body. I'm going to move my body. I'm going to rest well. I'm going to eat well. I'm going to have hobbies. I'm going to have friends. I'm going to invest in my social life. I'm going to, I'm going to do all that. And I'm going to run these businesses. And what that does is it forces you to not work on shit that's not relevant, to delegate whenever possible. Like you get efficient because by the way, if you're working eight hours a day and you're not getting everything that you need to get done, done, you're doing, you're, you're doing some mm -hmm. shit you shouldn't be doing. You know, 80, 20, dude, 20% of what you do results in 80% of the effort. So, so it's really about container and boundary and adhering to that very strictly and committing to investing in the other areas of your life that result in you being a happy person. Because look, let's say your business goes well, but you're miserable. And a lot of people like that. What the fuck was the point? What are you doing? You know, if you are having a successful business, but you're all burned out and stressed out and pissed off and anxious and irritated and overwhelmed. And now you're miserable to be around and nobody wants to hang out with you and you're not putting attention on your relationships. Okay. What, what are we doing here? Let's quit all this bullshit and go work six hours a day at Cracker Barrel, make enough money to pay the bills and be fucking happy. Like what, what are we doing here? People who are making that choice. And I think it's like, you have to understand it's a choice. Now, listen, I understand there's, there's, you know, not everyone starts in the same spot. People have their past traumas. Um, people might be listening to this in a country that doesn't have the kind of freedoms that we have. So I also get that there's privilege in this communication. But if you live in a free country, a country that allows you to choose where you put your time and energy and gives you the opportunity to, you know, make your own way. Um, and maybe you don't have anything to start with, right? Because right now we're also talking to people who have something like maybe you are working a full-time job and you got kids and you've been banging for 10 years and you're burned down and you're tired and you don't feel like you have any time or energy still in that position. 30 minutes once a week for yourself, 30 minutes once a month with a friend, 30 minutes once a week for your body and one hour, a couple times a week to move in the direction of your, you still get to choose. You still can do it. And I know a lot of people who climbed up out of, you know, uh, positions of, of less fortune that I, I didn't start with much, but I did. I wasn't, you know, sexually abused as a kid. I, you know, didn't grow up in a neighborhood where people were getting shot all around me. Um, I grew up in a poor, poor neighborhood, but, but I didn't have that kind of violence. Uh, you know, I had both parents in the home. Now, of course it was a commune. It was all kinds of crazy, but like, like I, I had a better start. I had a worse starting spot than a lot of people, but I had a better starting spot than a lot of people too. Right. So I get that there's a spectrum here. Um, and still I maintain that at a certain point, if you want to, uh, take responsibility for your life and get and achieve what you are capable of, you've got to decide to do it. And I decided from the jump that I wanted to have it all. I wanted to have a full life with an active social life, with a healthy body, with hobbies that I enjoyed that, that were outside of my work. Cause every, most business owners, their only hobby is business that's what they do. It's the only thing they want to talk about. It's the only thing they can relate to people about. It's the only cycle they've ever won out. Nothing wrong with that. I'm not claiming that that is a wrong path to take. Fucking A, man, do whatever makes you happy. For me, that was not the only goal I had. I wanted to still engage in martial arts. I wanted to still, you know, participate in my main hobby, which is my relationships, my social life. Like that's, I, I think that the juice of life comes from intimacy and connection. I think that's where where the joy is, is in experiences with people you love and investing in relationships. That's why I'm doing this camping trip, right? So I think experiences are where it's at. This is my own personal mantra. And so I'm investing in that. Maybe you're some kind of other way, but like, that's why you see me. It appears that I'm having all this fun. I've got all this free time. It's like, because I do, and I am, and that's deliberate and that's been built. And it's like, I have a lot more free time now than I did when I was first starting out, but I also have 130 team members and I still work hard, dude. It's a fucking Friday at noon. I've been working for three hours already. Like I put it in because I like to put it in. I enjoy what I'm doing. It's fun. I want to show up every day with a positive attitude and have a good time and move the ball forward. But I'm not putting in 
60, 80, 100 hour weeks, putting in 30 to 30 hour weeks, 40 hour weeks, maybe, you know, I'm working six hours a day, maybe eight, four days a week, you know, but, but I, but I've gotten to that position over time. There, there, there were times in my earlier career where I was doing a lot more. Maybe I'd work 10 hour days for weeks at a time, or maybe I'd work eight hours a day, five days a week. Like maybe I'd work 10 hours a day, five days a week. I've, I've gone through my, 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 you know, yep. wave format of, of what level I invest, but I've found a really good balance for myself now. And I also have like, Hey, one of my companies, Molly runs, she's the CEO. I'm the financier and the strategist and the business guy, but I don't, I'm not doing the day to day. I show up on a call here and there and give some advice, whatever, you know, do, do some content. Another one of my businesses, um, I've got, you know, Zipify, I've got like 90 team members. So my job is my job at this point is to talk to people about what they're doing and hold them accountable and, you know, provide feedback and direction and maybe make a video here and there. But it's like, my job is really easy in that company. Boom. I'm the CEO, but like, I got a copywriter, an advertiser, a chief technology officer, a supply chain person, uh, a COO who, who, who runs operations, a social media person. Uh, I got all kinds of, you know, customer support people, customer support team lead. And they're like, Hey, this is happening. What do you think? And then I'm in Slack, do this or that. Like, so it's like my job at this point is a lot easier in a way than it ever has been because I'm no longer driving. I'm only navigating, but nobody else can play the position that I play because I have the context. I've been doing it for 15 years. I can see things that people can't see because they're in the forest and I'm above the forest. And that's not a value judgment. It's not saying I am superior to them. The business doesn't work without them. The business doesn't work without me, but the position that I've figured out how to play is how to go from driver to navigator. And I think that's a position that a CEO has to go to at some point is you got to get off the road and you got to get up above the road and see what's coming and, and then direct the car that's on the road. Um, I'm kind of rambling. I don't know. I love I mean, it. No, I, I keep going. If you, if you got more, keep going. I don't even remember what the question is. <laughs> you run multiple businesses, right? You have a coaching program, you have software, you have an e-commerce business. If someone was listening right now and wanted to start a business, which not many of the listeners do, most of them are in business already. Which, which area would you tell them to go into the software, the coaching uh, slash consulting or the e-commerce and why? Uh, e-commerce all day. Uh, like, you know, just go product marketing support, right? We talked about those, the three pillars of the business product is the easiest in e-commerce. It is um, it's very simple. You know, it's, it's, it's packaging. Well, electronics are a little bit more complex, right? Because there's a whole lot there. Apparel is a little bit more complex. You've got multiple sizes and a lot of refunds. But, it, but at a high level, product is very simple with e-commerce because like, let's say you sell what I sell, which is like a tub with some goop in it. It's like a really wonderful tub. It's really amazing goop, but it's like more tubs, more goop. And that's, you know, Carrie thinks that minimizes the value. My wife thinks I shouldn't say tubs with goop, but it's like, I'm just trying to illustrate a point here. I'm not trying to diminish the value of our product, which is a really amazing product. But, but at the end of the day, as you scale that supply chain, it's not particularly complex, right? It's like more components, more stuff. So product's quite simple. Software, product's a code base. It's changing all the time. It's, you know, front end it. product is actually people with software because software, you have an, amorph an amorphous code base that needs people to manipulate it every day because it's talking to other things that are changing. It's talking to Shopify, which is changing. It's talking to recharge, which is changing. You need front end engineers, back end engineers, QAs, project managers. It's a nightmare. Um, and it's a never ending rabbit hole bullshit. It's breaking all the time. Like it's crazy, crazy hard. Uh, product with information publishing is hard because it goes out of style. If you don't update the course every six months, you can't sell it anymore or you're selling some shit that's old and outdated. So, so, you know, product with services is actually you're with service agency, you're buying and selling labor. So you're buying labor from someone on your team for 30 bucks an hour and you're selling it to the client at 60 bucks an hour. So it's actually the labor itself has to be done well, but then also there's the interaction with the client, which is part of the product, which is the relationship between the services agency and the client who's managing that and managing expectations and talking service is a fucking nightmare. I don't personally, I don't like it. Um, it's hard. You got to draw boundaries. It's like, where does the service start and where does it end? It's a, it's a lot about expectations, boundaries, um, you know, communication, um, it's very hard to do well, actually. Um, you know, coaching, you're selling your one-to-one -one time. 
that's the product is you and your time. Well, it's like, well, that's a shitty product because it doesn't scale. Um, hey, listen, anyone who has any of these business models, please do not think I am <laughs> telling you they are some level of bad because at the end of the day, my, my standing higher level opinion is you never knock a hustle. Anything that you like doing, that you're being successful at, that you're having fun, you're providing something that's good to the community or to the person who's buying it and you're making money, that's it, baby. You won the game. That's the game. You won. Now, I am looking, the reason I'm speaking this way is my goal is wealth creation. Okay. That's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to generate resource. I didn't have resource coming up. I looked at people who did. I said, I want to have that. I don't want my lights going out. I don't want the water turning off. I don't want to uh, not have any money to buy clothes for school. I don't want to have to eat the school lunches. I don't want to be the poor kid. Like I, all these things happened to me growing up. I don't want people falling through my floor because it's moldy. I don't want mushrooms growing out of my sink. Like I don't have resource and I want access to it. Okay. So I have that childhood trauma, if you will, that is moat that has motivated my desire for wealth creation. I want to take care of my family and provide a better life for them than, than I had, or that, you know, I had a great life, but like we didn't have a lot of money. Um, so, so if my goal is wealth creation, right? Well, wealth creation doesn't come from cash flow businesses. You can make money on a business that kicks off cash, but if you want to generate wealth, which is large sums of capital, you have to liquidate assets. That that's what wealth comes from. It comes from asset liquidation. So you could buy real estate and and let that real estate go up in value and then sell it. Okay, that you bought an asset, the asset appreciated, you sell the asset. The highest yielding business model in America is private equity. Private equity is the model of buying assets, businesses, optimizing them, and then selling them. And, and what, what I do is I build assets and then sell them. I'm now starting to buy, but I've always built. And if I'm going to build an asset for sale, the best asset is an asset that has the highest asset value, which in my opinion is also the easiest built business to build with asset value is e-commerce coaching. You can't sell information, publishing. You can't sell services is very hard to sell because it's all about you. And it's not a product that's agnostic from you and your persona e-commerce. You can build that asset. Product is the easiest support is the easiest with e-commerce questions about refunds and questions about the product. And then marketing is the same level of difficulty for every business support and software is very hard because the support people have to be as good as the as good at the software as the business owners who are using it or whoever's using it and support in information is very hard because the support people have to understand the information better than the people consuming it. E-commerce is the easiest support, easiest for product and marketing is the same level of difficulty in every business. E-commerce brands can also be sold for a multiple of their profit. So I think e-commerce is the best if the goal is wealth creation. If the goal is I want to make some money and have a good time at it and pay my bills, well, we got different goals now and we can have a different conversation. Love it. We'll, uh, we'll wrap up with this. Um, your slogan and I thought I had it here. I was wearing, I was wearing the sweatshirt the other day, um, is serve the world unselfishly and profit. Uh, what does that mean to you? And why is that so important? Give me one second here. Um, serve the world unselfishly and profit as a description. It's a, uh, it's not a, um, it's not like a statement. I guess it is a statement, but it's, it's more of a description of how things work, right? Uh, if you are in a role of service and you are doing that because it feels good to serve, because you want to serve, because that position feels good to you and you can help people and you can be of use, you will profit just through the act of service. You will profit let's say you don't make any money, you've profited because you helped somebody and you feel good about that. And, and it's like, it's a description of how the world works. If you serve the world unselfishly, you will profit. It will come back to you. It will come back. It may not be monetary. And so I, I aim to do that. I aim to be in a role of service with an unselfish, with unselfish motives. Now that doesn't mean that I don't want to pay my bills and take care of myself and have nice stuff and make money. I don't, that doesn't, that's not selfish. That's, uh, that's practical, right? But in my businesses, I want to serve my community. I want to offer, I want to make things that are truly good. 
I want to use that money that I make. I want to have a fair trade system where it's like someone trades me money for something that is valuable, truly valuable, that helps them. That's good. That's a, that's an act of service. I'm creating something in the marketplace that is um, wanted, that is better than anything else you can find for that problem that you are trying to solve that then brings you joy and a solution to your problem. And you give me money for that. And I can take that money and I can use it to pay my team better, to make better stuff, to invest, to take care of my family and my community, to use that towards causes in the world that I find noble. So serve the world unselfishly and profit is what I aim to do in life and also in business. But one of the biggest pushbacks people, people give, and I'm, I'm definitely not saying this. I'm just, I'm just trying to, to, to give a different perspective is that you got all this information. You don't have to create a smart marketer and go sell things and teach people how to do things. You can make a lot of money keeping that information to yourself and applying it on other businesses. Why is it so important to you to teach people? Well, I like doing it. I think that's important, right? I don't do things that are not fun and enjoyable, right? I, I focus on having a good time first and foremost. And if it's, if it's miserable, I don't do it. Um, it doesn't mean I don't grind and put in the work and, and all that kind of stuff, but it's like, I'm not going to stick with a cycle that doesn't bring me joy. And it brings me joy to support people on their path. I've walked this path for 16 years and I can support people in who are starting that. I think entrepreneurs make the world go round, man. Entrepreneurs take care of their community. Entrepreneurs generate resource for themselves and their family and the world. Like I, I think supporting entrepreneurship is one of the most important things I can do. And by the way, I'm uniquely qualified to do it. I, I did not start with any head starts when it comes to building businesses. I had no money to start with. I worked a full-time job. I, I, I understand how to do it. And so I think it's important to share that with the community. And then also, why wouldn't I monetize that activity when it makes sense and then use that resource to support more of that and also other businesses? It's like, I think it's a it's definitely not the business that make that it's like my least profitable and most time consuming business. So if, if my goal was just making money, I would not do smart marketer, but I like doing it. It's a lot of fun. It helps people. And, um, I think it's important that I, um, you know, give back to the community that's given so much to me. And that's why I like partnering with Shopify and I like speaking on stages. I like inspiring people. Like I get people re reaching out to me every day. Hey man, you changed my life. You, you, I can, I can take care of my family now because of the shit I learned from you free on your YouTube channel. And it's like, I, I like that. I like having that kind of an impact, not because I want to go flaunt it all around town and tell people how wonderful I am, but just because it feels good to know that I'm being supportive of people on their, on their path. And I didn't have that when I came up in the game, there wasn't a bunch of influencers out there helping people. It was like, there was a bunch of dudes on forums. It was like different back then. So, um, so I think it's important to help because I can, and also it's fun. And also I make some money at it. Well, I appreciate you doing it because I've definitely learned a lot from you. Um, and you've definitely helped me and I really appreciate you coming on here and now helping the listeners even more, uh, than you actually do on your own time. So Ezra, thank you so, so, so much. Really appreciate having yeah, you well, One last thing on that though, Please. is I'm just a guy who says some shit. You, the person then do the thing. Did I help you? Maybe I motivated you. I showed you what I did. I gave you inspiration. I showed you that it was possible. And I gave you energy to say, you can do this. Let's go. Maybe in inspiration, like, okay, I take credit for that. Hooray for me. But like you, the person went and did the fucking thing. You're the one who deserves the pat on the back. And every time someone tells me, man, I'm so thankful for what you did. I say, you should pat yourself on the back. You went and did it. I just said some shit on a screen or on a stage <laughs> and showed you how I did it. And then you went and did that. So, so I think while, yes, I deserve credit. On the other hand, the person who did the thing deserves the credit. Well, this is about my stage and I'm giving you credit and you don't get to throw it back anywhere else. All this right, is the credit right, for right. you. Thank you so, so much for coming back here and doing this again. Always fun to jam with you. Um, and hopefully I'm going to see you soon. So uh, thank you again. Yeah, brother. My pleasure. I appreciate you having me on. I love your little short clips. You do a really good job producing it. You put, uh, you, you, you do the best job producing these clips that then are on social. I just think you do a really good job of all that. I appreciate that. Thank you. But I just produce the clips. It's you that gives me the content in order to produce it. Right. See how it works? There you go. All right. well, I guess it goes both ways. Appreciate you. Hey, everyone. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you want, check out our most recent video over here 
And this one is the one YouTube thinks you'll like. But if you really enjoyed watching, please do me a favor, like and subscribe over here. Thank you so much.